All right, guys, so this video is actually gonna be more of an audio video. It's, a, it's more of a summary of what we've learned so far in the biochemistry series. Uh, and as always, I always say, you know, the best way to learn this is to, is to tell a story. And this is more of just a, a giant continuation of everything, and hopefully it just helps. You know, if you can kind of listen to it, and then if you listen to it a second time, and if you, if you can stay one step ahead of me throughout, you know, that's the best way I think you can learn. I think uh, this was kind of inspired by, you know, when I was going through the process of the, the Goyan uh, pathology, you know, auto, you know, audio series, and I listened to them so many times in my car that I could always predict what was going to come next and, and such. So I'm hoping that we can accomplish the same thing with this. So, anyways, it's a, yeah, again, it's a summary of all the videos that we've learned so far, and I think it's something that we can uh, build upon. So, hope you like the, uh, the audio. All right, guys. So we started phenylalanine, and phenylalanine is an essential amino acid. Uh, you got to get it in the diet. And so phenylalanine goes to tyrosine, which goes to L-dopa, which goes to dopamine, which goes to norepinephrine, which goes to epinephrine. So we got to know that pathway. Now we know that phenylalanine goes to tyrosine in the setting of phenylalanine hydroxylase. So we know that phenylalanine hydroxylase, if you're deficient in that enzymes, you're going to have what? What are the symptoms that you have? You would have a musty smell. Uh, you'd have it's just like seizures in kids. Um, and so what, what's the condition? That's PKU. Now, usually they're going to ask that question. It's going to be a young person. Usually going to have it. It's been an immigrant because usually, you know, PKU or deficiency in phenylal phenylalanine hydroxylase is going to be screened two to three days after birth, um, normally here like in America. So, but if they came from a different country to where that wasn't done, uh, then you're kind of setting yourself up to maybe kind of having this condition or at least not, it not being caught right out of the gate. Now, you can treat the, the PKU, that musty smell, seizures in kids, um, having that increase in phenyl uh, ketones in the urine. You can treat that with the, you know, via the diet, which you'll do what? You'll decrease your phenylalanine um, in the diet, and then you'll supplement with tyrosine. You're just kind of bypassing that one little step. But then, remember, there's also a second question, kind of a, a PKU that's not based off the deficiency in phenylalanine hydroxylase, right? That's what? That's a deficiency in biopterin. Uh, because biopterin, the BH4, uh, is, gets used with phenylalanine to tyrosine as well as the step of tyrosine to L-dopa. You use the biopterin, goes into the dihydrobiopterin, and then the dihydrobiopterin in the setting of dihydrobiopterin reductase gets kicked back to the BH4. Right, so it's a continual, you know, it'll be reproduced, but if you don't have the dihydrobiopterin reductase, which is usually that other kind of answer, you're not making the biopterin. So even though you would supp you know, have a, a the, 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 the diet that's been changed where you're supplementing with tyrosine, well, you might get tyrosine in your diet, but remember, it's the next step that also has biopterin, so you're not going forward on that. And so, how are they going to ask that question? What was the way they did it? They said, well, there's an elevated prolactin level. Okay. So then you have to say, well, what would elevate a prolactin level um, in a young kid, seizures, musty smell, that's not just a deficiency in phenylalanine hydroxylase? Well, they're going to tell you that they did a dietary change. So they have the tyrosine. But if you don't have that biopterin, then tyrosine can't go to L-DOPA or it can't do it very effectively. So then you don't you're not making dopamine and remember dopamine is what kind of keeps the keeps your foot on the brake on the prolactin levels because if you are deficient or have less dopamine you're going to have an elevated prolactin and remember just like in in psychiatry behavioral health you know they use antipsychotics or dopamine blockers like haldol risperdal you know those are kind of your main players or haloperidol and uh, uh, risperidone or just make sure the terminology is right. Uh, those are the major players that'll block dopamine um, on your exams, and you're going to have uh, ele potentially elevated prolactin levels. But in this situation, uh, for PKU, if you're deficient in the biopterin uh, path part of it, as opposed to the phenylalanine hydroxylase, that's where they're going to ask you that there's an elevated prolactin due to the decrease in dopamine that despite the dietary uh, supplementation or alteration you're still getting uh, you know kind of those type of type of symptoms and such okay so you got to know phenylalanine goes to tyrosine 
in the setting of phenylalanine hydroxylase. Tyrosine goes straight ahead to L-DOPA in the setting of tyrosine hydroxylase, or it can take a right turn. If tyrosine takes a right turn, it goes down to homogentosate, right? Also known as homogentosic acid. Now, homogentosate uh, in the setting of homogentosate dioxygenase makes maleoacetoacetic acid, and then it goes on to make fumarylacetic acid to make fumarate, okay? Now, fumarate gets us into the TCA. It creates that discussion. But if we go back to hem homogentosate, and again, the enzyme is homogentosate dioxygenase. Now, if I have an impairment of that, um, you know, of that enzyme, the homogentosate dioxygenase, what's going to happen? What's the condition? The condition is alcomptonuria. I'm going to have what? What am I going to? What is it going to look like? It's going to have darkened patches on the ears, the cartilage. You're going to have severe joint pain, stiffness. Uh, they ha they use the word debilitating, de debilitating joint pain, arthritis. Uh, the urine turns color when exposed to air, and the pigmented uh, sclera, okay? So, homogentosate, or homogentosic acid, there's a buildup if you are deficient in homogentosate dioxygenase. What's that condition called? Alcomptonuria. Now, sometimes they're going to ask you, they'll go back and ask you, what's the inheritance pattern? If you do not know, in this situation, it's autosomal recessive, but if you do not know, typically, if it's an enzyme deficiency, um, when in doubt, just put autosomal recessive because enzyme deficiencies are typically that. Not in all cases, but typically if you don't know, go autosomal recessive. So again, you took a right turn at tyrosine and it goes all the way down to homogentosate or homogentosic acid. In the set, if you, the next step would be the homogentosate dioxygenase, but if you're deficient in that or it's ineffective, you have alcomptonuria, autosomal recessive. If it does work, you keep going down, you eventually you make your way to fumarate. But now back up to tyrosinase. Oh, I'm sorry, back up to tyrosine. Now, tyrosine can go forward and make L-DOPA in the setting of tyrosine hydroxylase. L-DOPA can go forward in the setting of dopamine decarboxylase and make dopamine. Now, L-DOPA, you know, it can kind of take a left turn there for slightly, and it can make in the setting of tyrosinase, okay? So L-DOPA in the setting of tyrosinase, even though I know you're thinking, well, shouldn't tyrosinase be with tyrosine? Uh, sure, if it makes you sound, if it makes you feel any better on that, uh, this is just kind of where I read it from. The, it came from the L-DOPA. But anyways, nevertheless, whether it's tyrosine or L-DOPA, in the setting of tyrosinase makes melanin. Okay, and that's and that's a key. So if you're deficient in tyrosinase, you're not going to make melanin. Okay. Well, what do I need melanin for? Well, melanin, you need it for the for the skin color, right? So if I'm deficient in seeing ty tyrosinase, what am I going to have? Albinism. You know, it's a lack or deficiency of the tyrosinase, okay? And again, if it's an enzyme deficiency, think autosomal recessive. Now, for that albinism, again, they'll say it's either a deficiency in the tyrosinase, which makes sense. It could be a defective tyrosinase transporter, okay? Which is your <clears throat> decrease in the... Uh, uh, you say tyrosine, um, or lack of the migration of the neural crest cells um, can also create the albinism. But for our purposes right now, I want you to know that if there's a decrease in the tyrosinase, you're not making the melanin, you got the albinism. So L-DOPA goes forward and makes dopamine, and then dopamine in the setting of dopamine beta hydroxylase makes norepinephrine, and then norepinephrine in the setting of SAM as well as phenylethanolamine and methyltransferase makes epinephrine. So, but when we go back to the dopamine, again, L-DOPA makes dopamine. Now, dopamine go, can go forward norepinephrine, or it can take a right turn, as could norepinephrine. They both could take a right turn, and they both can be broken down. Dopamine can be broken down by the MAOB, or COMT, the catecholamine, catecholomethyltransferase, um, COMT. So, dopamine can be broken down by MAO, MAOB and COMT. Now, we sometimes want dopamine to kind of linger around, right? Conditions such as uh, Parkinson's. So in Parkinson's, we want dopamine to linger, so we, they would give medications to help that. So they would use COMT inhibitors, right? Because the COMT breaks dopamine down, so if we inhibit the COMT, it doesn't break the dopamine down as much. So the, that's where you get the tolcapone and enticapone. And they really just extend the duration of, like, say, levodopa and carbidopa uh, and such like that. Um, do you recall what part of the brain uh, is pale? Um, if you if you kind of like a Parkinson-esque, uh, you know, what part of the brain would be pale or dull? 
and you would say the substantia nigra. So again, dopamine uh, can take a right turn, be broken down by MAOB or CMT, or it can go straight in the setting of dopamine beta hydroxylase and make norepinephrine. Now, norepinephrine can make a right turn and be broken down by MAOA and COMT, and it can go on to uh, go on to make VMA. So again, you can use COMT inhibitors or MAOA inhibitors, and of course, you would have an increase or a lingering elevated norepinephrine. And norepinephrine can go straight ahead uh, in the setting of SAM or phenylethanolamine and methyltransferase to make epinephrine. And that step can be upregulated by what? You know, what, upre what, what upregulates phenylethanolamine and methyltransferase into epinephrine uh, and norepinephrine and epinephrine? And that would be cortisol. Okay? So again, you know, we really like that the phenylalanine pathway the questions that they like to ask are obviously with the PKU, you gotta know both situations where it could be a deficiency in phenyl, phenylalanine hydroxylase or a biopterin. If they start talking about elevated prolactin levels, you better be jumping all over the biopterin or the, or the dihydrobiopterin reductase deficiency. Uh, you gotta know that if you have deficiency in tyrosinase, you can have the albinism. Um, and the albinism can also be made uh, secondary to the lack of migration of neural crest cells as well. And then the, do the dopamine, the norepinephrine, the epinephrine, uh, the dopamine and norepinephrine, they can be broken down by the MAOB and MAOA respectively, as well as the COMTs. Uh, so you gotta know that pathway because that's where they use the medications. And if things are, are if there's an, an impairment in that pathway, you gotta know those enzymes. So again, phenyl phenylalanine in the setting of phenyl uh, phenylalanine hydroxylase makes tyrosine. Tyrosine in the setting of tyrosine hydroxylase makes L-DOPA. L-DOPA in the setting of dopamine decarboxylase makes dopamine. Dopamine in the setting of dopamine beta hydroxylase makes norepinephrine. And then norepinephrine in the setting of SAM and phenylethanolamine and methyltransferase, methyltransferase upregulated by cortisol makes epinephrine. Tyrosine can take a right turn down to homogentisate also known as homogentic acid, and in the setting of homogentisate dioxygenase can make maleolacidic acidic acid or fumaril, and then fumaril acidic acid, and then make fumarate. But if you have a deficiency in the homogentisate dioxygenase, then you're gonna have a buildup of what? You're gonna have a buildup of homogentisate, also known as homogentisic acid. And then that condition is known as alcantonuria. What's the inheritance pattern? Autosomal recessive. What's the, what does it look like? Darkened patches on the ears, the cartilage, debilitating uh, joint pain, arthritis, urine turns color when exposed to air, and the pigmented sclera. Okay, so you gotta know the phenylalanine uh, pathway there. Now, we also talked about homocysteine. Okay, and with homocysteine, you need to know that you know homocysteine can go and take a right turn or a left turn, and this is all kind of like you know normal pathway kind of stuff. So homocysteine in the setting of serine and B6 and cystathione synthase can make cystathione. So we don't wanna, we, it's like this, homocysteine, we start there. We don't want a buildup of homocysteine. Why? Because a buildup of homocysteine in the urine can cause mental retardation, osteoporosis, you know, um, downward lens dislocation and stroke or an MI in a young person, okay? So we don't want homocysteine lingering around, so we need it broken down. We need it to either go right or left. And homocysteine, if it, if it goes right, it would go to cystathione. But what do I need for that to happen? Well, I need serine, I need B6, and I need cystathione synthase. So if I have those things, homocysteine can go to cystathione. And then cystathione goes into cystathione which is C C Y S T E I N E cysteine. Now, two cysteines can make a cysteine, which ends in I N E. Now, the thing about cysteine, uh, two cysteine makes you can make those can make kidney stones. Okay, they're kind of on the, the lower end of the frequency, but um, as far as uh, being common, but they're the hexagonal shaped kidney stones, especially you think kidney stone in a very, very young person. Like this homocystinuria, if you know, if you have a stroke or an MI in a young person or osteoporosis in a young person, you better be jumping all over homocyst homocystinuria, okay? So we said homocystinuria either needs to take a right turn to become cystathione or a left turn. If it takes a left turn, it's gonna turn into methionine, okay? 
Now methionine, what do you need for that to work? Well, for homocysteine to turn in methionine, you need homocysteine methyltransferase. In addition to, well, when I said the word methyl, but in addition to B12. So again, I don't like homocysteine all by itself. I want it to be broken down. It can take a right turn to cysteine or a left turn to methionine. If it takes a left turn to methionine, I need homocysteine methyl, uh, methyltransferase. Well, in addition to what? Well, that requires B12. Now, I like methionine, right? It's, it's like the star codone, DNA, all that kind of good stuff. Um, so now that you know that homocysteine can take a right turn to cystathione and make cysteine, or a left turn to make methionine, now you know, well, if you have a deficiency in one of those two ways, then what's gonna happen? If I have a deficiency of taking a right turn, then what's, what's homocysteine gonna do? Everything's gonna get pushed to the left, and I'm gonna have an increase in what? Methionine. So there's three things that they talk about that can cause an increase in homocysteine or homocystinuria. You can have one, a cystathione synthase deficiency, right? That's the one where you, where you took the right turn. Um, you need cystathione synthase with B6 and serine to make cystathione. So if you have a deficiency in cystathione synthase deficiency, everything's going to get pushed to the left. So how do you treat that? Well, you you better not eat as much methionine or somehow figure out how to decrease that. You got to increase the cysteine, right? That amino acid going, going that way. And you want to have more B12 because you don't, you, if that's the only pathway going to the left that works, then you need to keep that going as much and much as much as you can. So you want to have more B12 so you don't become deficient in that because everything is getting pushed in that direction. So to treat a cystathione synthase deficiency, you got to decrease methionine because you're already making, you're, you're going to be pushing everything that direction as it is. You're going to increase the cysteine and then you're going to increase B12. The second way is you're going to have a decreased affinity for the cystathione synthase. All right, remember homocysteine can take a right turn, but it needs cystathione synthase. But if there's a decreased affinity for cystathione synthase for that B6, then that's going to cause a problem, right? It's going to cause a, the homocysteine to build up and get pushed to the left again. So how do I fix that one? Well, I can just give additional B6. If there's a decreased affinity for it, then just give more B6, just give them as much as they can, it's water soluble, um, and see if we can kick start that pathway to work a little bit better. And then the last way, the third way, is a homocysteine methyltransferase deficiency. Remember, homocysteine to go to methionine needed what two things? Well, it needed B12, but it needed the homocysteine methyltransferase, okay? So if you have a deficiency in that, then, of course, everything is going to get kicked to the right. So how do you treat that? You give them a lot of B12, right? B12, 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 and hopefully that'll kind of kickstart that way to go as well. But in homocysteinuria, uh, remember, you, you, it's going to be looking for a young kid, MI, stroke, osteoporosis. And remember on the DEXA scan, what's the DEXA scan where they measure osteoporosis? What are the, what are the readings going to be? It's going to be uh, negative one or less, okay? Negative one or less. That's going to be the osteoporosis, okay? And then remember how we said the cysteine, the E-I-N-E, -E -I -E, two of those, two of those cysteines can make uh, a cysteine. Now that can be the kidney stones and those are going to be hexagonal shaped. So there's four types of kidney stones uh, that you kind of have to know for step one. And, you know, let's just talk about them from the shape perspective. You can have the calcium kidney stones. They're going to be dumbbell shaped or enveloped shaped. Okay. Calcium type are going to be dumbbell or envelope shaped. You can have the uric acid. Those are going to be rhomboid or football shaped. You can have the stervite. Those are going to be that coffin lid as they describe it. And then you have the cysteine, um, and those are going to be hexagonal. So again, the kidney stones, four types, based just based on shape for right now. Calcium would be, if I said, well, if I said dumbbell shaped or envelope shaped, you would say calcium type. If I said rhomboid or football shaped, you'd say uric acid. If I said coffin lid, you say stervite. And if I said hexagonal, you say cysteine. And again, guys, I'm just saying, if you can try to, if you listen to this more than once, you can stay one step ahead of me as we do this. So again, if I said dumbbell shaped, you say calcium. If I say rhomboid, you say uric acid. If I say coffin lid, you say stervite. If I say hexagonal, you say cysteine. Okay. Now, the last little piece on this is going to be the, uh, 
we're gonna make our way into the Krebs cycle, okay? We're gonna make our way into the Krebs cycle. And so we start with glucose. Glucose is a six carbon unit, right? Six carbons. And at the very beginning of this, we use two ATP and we can break that six carbon into two different threes, okay? So then from that point, everything we do is kind of times two or twice. So we have glucose in this with using two ATPs. Uh, it gets broken down into two, three carbon units. And then we use NAD+, you know, next step, next step, produce a little ATP. And eventually we get to this thing called phos fossil phosphophenyl pyruvate, PEP, right? Uh, PEP, phosphoenyl pyruvate. And what's important about this is phosphoenyl pyruvate in the setting of pyruvate kinase goes to pyruvate. And now I always say, guys, when you get to pyruvate, you gotta pause, take a you know, take a break, and and realize that pyruvate can either take a right turn or go straight into the, or closer to Krebs cycle. But the PEP or phosphoenyl pyruvate is a one direction thing to pyruvate. Okay, and that's important because at some point there there may be a question that says, look, guys, we need to make some glucose here. But the, there were a couple one-way direction steps. You know, the PEP to pyruvate and the P and the pyruvate to acetyl-CoA were, were all one direction. How do we bypass that and get back up to where we make some glucose? And that's why I think it's important that you know the phosphenyl pyruvate uh, step. And there's one thing that we will talk about here in just a second within the Krebs that you'll use as the energy source to make that step happen to go back up top to glucose. But for right now, the phosphenyl pyruvate goes in the setting of pyruvate kinase makes pyruvate. Now, pyruvate can either take a right turn to lactate or go down to acetyl-CoA. Now, what determines whether pyruvate goes right or it goes down into the Krebs? And you're gonna say oxygen. If there's no oxygen or little oxygen, it's gonna kind of skew everything to go toward lactate. But we gotta know there's two things that get used. For pyruvate to go to lactate, there's two things, right? Number one is lactate dehydrogenase, right? Lactate dehydrogenase, so pyruvate in the setting of lactate dehydrogenase can go to lactate, but we also need to use a little, use what? NADH, very important, NADH. So NADH with lactate dehydrogenate, dehydrogenase makes lactate and it'll produce NAD+. Now, what, because there's some questions that are out there that says, if you have a deficiency in lactate dehydrogenase, which of the following would be built up? Well, when you think about that, if you're using NADH and you would create NAD+, if you have a deficiency in, in lactate dehydrogenase, which one's gonna build up between those two? The NADH. So for you, you just need to know that pyruvate, if oxygen's low, is gonna get pushed to uh, lactate, but we need lactate dehydrogenase and we need NADH to produce the NAD+. Now that NAD+, can go back up top and as glucose is being broken down, you know, where NAD plus uh, creates NADH and makes some ATP, you know, I think at the kind of a net there, we used two ATP back up top, but we created four ATP. Now it's not the best case scenario. You know, you're making some energy, you're making some ATP, even not in the setting of oxygen, where there's little or no oxygen, you know, it's not the most uh, efficient, but you're still creating energy uh, to keep the party going. So that's the purpose of going pyruvate and, and low oxygen going to lactate. Now, pyruvate can go down. Now, pyruvate can go down and make acetyl-CoA, which is a two carbon unit. So pyruvate's three, acetyl-CoA is two. So we lose a carbon in, the, in that little uh, step there. But pyruvate needs pyruvate dehydrogenase, okay? So pyruvate in the setting of pyruvate dehydrogenase makes acetyl-CoA. Now, what are those five little cofactor deals that we need in that step from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. That's the tender loving care for Nancy, right? The tender loving care for Nancy, T stands for thiamine, B1. The L stands for lipoic acid. The, the C stands for CoA. The F stands for FAD, riboflavin. And the N stands for niacin, uh, B3. So tender loving care for Nancy, we need those guys to make the pyruvate dehydrogenase step to go from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA to work. Um, and there's a couple other steps where we use the tender loving care for Nancy, but you gotta know those, right? They like that whole, if there's an alcoholic or something, <clears throat> then you gotta know that that thiamine could be impaired. And this is one of those steps that they could test you on to know that you need tender loving care for Nancy in this step particularly. So if you have oxygen, pyruvate's gonna go down to acetyl-CoA. 
you're going to use pyruvate dehydrogenase with tender loving care for Nancy, um, and that acetyl CoA is is going to combine with the oxyl acetate to make citrate. Okay, and then now you're in the Krebs cycle, right? Citrate, and remember, citrate is Krebs starting substrate for making oxyl acetate. That's just how you memorize it. But you know, it's not so much that you got to memorize each step. You just got to know the ones uh, that are important. Now, as you go down there, it's the isocitrate. You know, the isocitrate with the with the um, isocitrate dehydrogenase. That's the rate limiting step. Okay, that's the rate limiting step. So if you have a uh, uh, you know a ton of ATP, then it's going to downregulate that step. If you have a ton of NADH, it's going to downregulate. If you have um, uh, ADP, it's going to upregulate it. So, anyways, the isocitrate to alpha ketoglutarate in the setting of isocitrate dehydrogenase is the rate limiting step for the Krebs cycle. You lose the CO2. Uh, anyways, so then it goes to alpha ketoglutarate. Now, alpha ketoglutarate to succinyl CoA, it needs alpha, ketoglu alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. But what else does it need? This is that other step where it uses the tender loving care for Nancy. So again, if you have an alcoholic, they could test you on this step in the Krebs cycle as being impaired, not as efficient or, or whatnot, uh, because of the B1 deficiency. So we're in the Krebs cycle. Isocitrate goes to alpha-ketoglutarate, rate limiting step. Then alpha-ketoglutarate goes to succinyl-CoA using alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase and the tender loving care for Nancy. And then the succinyl-CoA goes to succinate. Now what's important about this step? Because in this step, you know, succinyl-CoA is kind of an interesting one because it goes to succinate, but also stuff goes into succinyl-CoA we'll talk about in a second. But succinyl-CoA goes to succinate, it produces GTP, okay? Now, who cares about GTP? Well, you're going to care because that's the, that's the energy source that you're going to use for the decarboxylation of the oxaloacetate to the PEP. Remember how I talked about earlier about those one-way one direction steps that need to be, if I need glucose, I need to bypass those one direction steps and somehow get, a, get ahead of them, get above them. You're gonna use GTP from that step right there, from the succinyl-CoA to the succinate, that's where GTP is produced. Um, and that GTP is used to go from oxaloacetate to PEP, and then, and then you can go straight up and make some glucose if you need it. Okay, that's the purpose for you, step one, and GTP. Okay, if you see that thing, you better know that that GTP came from the step of succinyl-CoA to succinate. And then succinate goes to fumarate, makes um, FADH. And again, that's just basically, uh, it'll go to electron transport and make some energy. And then fumarate goes to malate, malate goes to oxaloacetate, and such. Uh, so again, uh, citrate is Krebs starting substrate for making oxaloacetate. There's a rate limiting step of isocitrate to alpha ketoglutarate, the alpha ketoglutarate to succinyl CoA. Uh, you need the tender loving care for Nancy in addition to the alpha, ketoglu alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. The succinyl CoA to the succinate, you better know that's where they produce the GTP, so you can make the bypass step. And then the succinate to fumarate makes our FADH for a little extra energy to in electron transport. And then, you know, we talked about a couple other little little things is if you get that maple syrup uh you know the 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 maple syrup disease and let me just make sure i can kind of get that one for you is is the the branch chain amino acids like the i love vermont okay the i love vermont where you have the uh isoleucine leucine and and valine now the the urine of course again it, it's a classic test question and the urine smells like maple syrup why do we care? Well, we care because it can cause CNS defects, mental retardation, and and death. So, where do these come into play? Why do we? How are they going to test this? Well, remember what we said. Back up on that, where pyruvate goes to acetyl CoA. Well, there's an arrow that goes into acetyl CoA from the far right. It goes in there, and it's leucine. Okay, it starts with leucine. Now, when in doubt, if you see maple syrup disease. Um, leucine's mainly, out of, out of those three, I want you to choose the leucine. But leucine, in the setting of alpha keto acid dehydrogenase, okay, makes acetyl CoA. So leucine can make acetyl CoA in the setting of alpha keto acid dehydrogenase. But what do you need with that? Tender loving care for Nancy. There's, so there was that third way that can be impaired as well. Um, 
that you, that leucine would be built up or what or whatnot, um, or you can't make the acetyl CoA if the impairment of the alpha keto acid dehydrogenase, because you need the tender loving care for Nancy uh, for that way. So you have a buildup of the um, alpha keto acids and stuff. Now down below on that Krebs cycle, remember how I said succinyl CoA has stuff kind of going into him as well? Well, the isoleucine and the valine in the setting of alpha keto acid dehydrogenase makes propionyl CoA, which makes methylmalonyl CoA, and methylmalonyl CoA makes succinyl CoA. Boom, now you're in the Krebs cycle again. But that step from methylmalonyl CoA to succinyl CoA requires B12. That's why there's a test, a more accurate test of a B12 deficiency, is you're gonna have a buildup of what? Methylmalonyl CoA, methylmalonic acid, right? That's the, a more accurate test for, for a B12 deficiency is to know that you have a buildup of methylmalonyl uh, CoA. So, but again, the isoleucine and the valine need alpha keto acid dehydrogenase uh, to make the propion CoA, to make the methylmalonyl CoA, to get into the succinyl CoA with the B12. So you got to know those. And uh, again, when in doubt, um, when in doubt, you need to put leucine, even though it's the, the branch chain is going to be the uh, isoleucine, uh, leucine, and the valine, uh, leucine is kind of our, our culprit on that. So if you, uh, you know, which ones are, you know, I mean, I'm trying to, th trying to think of, of how this, if, if we want low sugar, you know, if we want uh, the, the, the ketogenic uh, vitamins, kind of a separate question, if we want the ketogenic uh, amino acids, I'm sorry, the ketogenic amino acids, uh, they're, that are the, one, the only ones that are exclusively ketogenic, like if we want low sugar, uh, we want more ketogenic, the ones that we should be looking at are the leucine and lysine, they are, they are ex uh, exclusive um, ketogenic leucine and lysine. But if you get the maple syrup deal, you gotta be think the problem is gonna be leucine. Uh, as, an, as a backup, you're gonna say it's isoleucine or valine. Okay, so again, guys, this is what we have so far on the uh, biochemistry. And if you can just tell that story, um, just tell the story, start from the beginning and tell the story, I think you're gonna have a better chance of, of memorizing this and then being effective uh, when it comes to your step one. So hope it was helpful, guys.